I want to walk you through a few concepts more in depth related to epigenesis. By the end of this brief lecture, I hope you feel more comfortable with the following terms so you can apply them in this week's health profile. These are all related to how our genotype or genetic makeup leads to our phenotype. It is not set in stone. Your environment and, influ and experiences influence what you become. They influence and are influenced by your genetics. This is why considering nature and nurture is so complicated. So we know that we can't separate nature and nurture, like parts of an equation. And it's probably not best to think about nature and nurture as a Venn diagram, where some traits are explained by na nature, some are by nurture, and some by both. It's much more complicated and intertwined, like cogs that drive each other. In fact, many simple examples you've been given on how specific genotypes lead to certain phenotypes just aren't quite accurate. It isn't as simple as Mendel's pea plants. The explanation you've been provided for whether you can curl your tongue and what determines eye and hair color demonstrate the complexity of genes in the environment. For example, you can actually train yourself to curl your tongue. There are multiple factors that determine this phenotype. This is multifactorial transmission. Moreover, there are different genes involved in hair and eye color, and the combination of these genes and even mutations of these genes could lead to unanticipated results. This is polygenic inheritance. Two of your vocab words discuss directly the complexity of nature and nurture, specifically how we can figure out when specific genotypes lead to specific phenotypes. The first term, polygenic inheritance, relates to how there are many genes that can lead to one trait. Multifactorial transmission acknowledges that there are both genetic and environmental factors contributing to an outcome, like the HTTP allele that you'll read about in both the endophenotype and probabilistic epigenous articles. Look at the root words to remember which is which. Poly means many. Many genes. Multi means multiple. Multiple factors. These terms fall under the broader umbrella term of epigenetics, as you heard described quite well by Dr. Nessa Carey. We're very interested in why people with similar genetic makeup end up differently, or why people with very different genetic makeup end up the same. This is a field of psychology called developmental psychopathology. They use a metaphor of a tree. In this metaphor, the branching trees are how people diverge. Why would two people who went along very different paths end up in a similar place, like leaves B and C? They came from different branches. Similarly, why would two people from the same branch, C, B, and D, end up at very different places? If in this metaphor we think of how high people get on the tree with how well they are doing, and the dark branches as paths filled with more risk, where we could consider people to have more difficult times, when we add that layer to the metaphor, we could consider why A, which could be thought of as a path with higher SES, good resources, few environmental risk factors, such as people who don't experience divorce, tragedy, or abuse, do poorer than B, C, and D, who are leaves that may have experienced one or many of these risk factors. In this manner, epigenetics and psychology is the current mode that requires us to integrate psychological measurement with genetics so we can figure out why results aren't certain, why genes make outcomes more probable but in no way certain, and how genes can be switched on and off by environmental factors. This leads to the term you read about in Gottlieb's article on probabilistic epigenesis. Gottlieb was the first theorist in psychological sciences to propose this idea, which means that phenotypic outcomes are probable or likely based on genotype, but in no way certain. This idea wasn't completely new. As early as 1928, another psychological th theorist, Arnold Giselle, put this simply as, heredity sets the boundaries for the influence of the environment. This is what is meant by the term I'd like you to know, reaction range. Your genetics set up a range of potential. With good environmental influences, you may reach your upper range. With risk factors, you may not. So if you are born with a potential for an IQ between 90 and 110, remember that 100 is average and 15 is a standard deviation in IQ. And you have a really rich environment with lots of experiences, books, and optimal socio-emotional factors. Then these, in combination with your genes, would make it more likely you get to a higher range. If you're born in poverty, famine, and poor socio-emotional environments, you may be more likely to test at a lower range later in life.
There are some traits that have a greater range of outcomes based on genes, and others where environment has less of an influence. For example, your physical outcomes, like height, can be influenced to a degree by the environment, but not as much as other traits, like the example I gave with IQ. This is termed canalization. So let's end with another metaphor that is used to describe probabilistic epigenesis. Conrad Waddington was a developmental biologist, paleontologist, geneticist, embryologist, and philosopher who proposed an epigenetic landscape. This could be used to consider how our cells differentiate in development due to epigenetic influences, as is represented with this figure that I found from a review article published in a biology journal called Development in 2009. But we use this in psychology to consider how genes are influenced by the environment. You could think of this at genetic potential as a ball rolling down the hill. With strong environmental influences, this ball will take the path of least resistance and go down the deepest crevice, as seen with a green line. But what if a strong environmental influence shifted you off the path? For example, if you have the genetic makeup that predisposes you to diabetes or heart disease, this makes it more likely or probable that you may have this disease. But certain environmental influences, like a good diet and exercise, low stress and good coping, could help it so this genotype isn't expressed in your phenotype. Similarly, with very strong environmental influences, you could completely shift off your, your track to a very different outcome. You can see how this is so critical for understanding health psychology. We want to consider the biopsychosocial model to figure out why people arrive at certain health outcomes, which means considering their biological predisposition as well as psychological, biological, and social factors that could influence how probable these outcomes are. I hope introducing you to these topics and epigenetics will help you to widen your perspective on health outcomes and how health psychologists can research and influence these outcomes.